on an important topic which is i think more important for the residents in cardiology uh, that is the ecg versus intra cardiac electrogram the basics and uh, we'll, uh, we are having uh, in between us dr arun gopi who is going to discuss on this topic uh, dr arun gopi has finished his md medicine from aims new delhi and dm cardiology from pgi chandigarh and he did his electrophysiology fellowship from kr hospital hyderabad he has many publications uh, in both the national and international journals currently he sir is working as a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at metro international cardiac center calicut uh, we welcome you sir yeah uh thank you sir uh, so are we starting on um uh yes sir yes sir we'll start sir okay thank you sudhakar so welcome you all uh, warm good evening to all and um, at the outset i thank metronic for the opportunity and uh, today we are going to discuss uh, uh, a very basic topic uh, for uh, for uh, cardiology residents as sudhakar put it uh, it is on um, the correlation between um, ecg and electrocardiogram and um, uh i hope my slides are up and uh, am i audible my is my audio okay uh yes sir it's at the end uh, of that am i sli- am my slides yeah out? yes sir yes sir uh is the audio okay yes sir okay so um, we'll get started so the topic for today is um Uh, a very basic topic in electrophysiology that is uh, the correlation between the intracardiac electrogram and the surface EK, uh, ecg and um, uh, this would be the outline of my talk so we'll understand how the electrocardiograms intracardiac electrograms are recorded we will understand what these electrograms annotate to or what kind of information that these electrograms give we are we will try to uh, understand the normal activation pattern uh, inside both the chambers of uh, inside the body atrium and ventricles we are uh, we'll also go through the normal uh, be normal intervals um, in a normal sinus rhythm and uh, try to ascertain how uh, correlating between the egms and ecg you can ascertain uh, what kind of rhythm disorders are going on this is actually a quite vast topic they have been uh, monographs written on this and this is one monograph uh, written on by by fred kusumoto it's a very uh, elegantly written book uh, for people who want uh, more uh, information on this topic uh, this would be the go through to uh, understanding uh, intracardiac egms and ecg by fred kusumoto uh, i'll be just giving you a bird's eye view on this topic so uh taking you back to your uh, physiology classes all what we are going to deal uh, with in the next 30 minutes or so is basically uh, gen- uh basically generated from the cardiac myocyte the the uh, moving in of sodium channels and moving out of potassium channels within the uh, cardiac myocyte leads on to repolarization and repolarization waveforms and uh, the direction of uh, transmission of these uh, waveforms generate what you call the electrical potentials within the heart and ecg as you all know is nothing but the summation of all the electrical activity of the entire heart that is recorded from the surface of body using electrodes in fact it is some of all the action potentials from all the cardiac uh, from all the cardiac myocytes and the summated effect of all the action potentials is what is recorded as the ecg in fact uh, the advantage of having the summated recording is that it, it provides information on both the cardiac depolarization as well as repolarization on the contrary intracardiac egms are recorded by placing catheters inside the heart in specified locations which i will be alluding to in my talk and once you have placed catheters inside the heart the electrodes of these catheters record electrical activity from a localized area where they are placed so when you place a catheter in right atrial in a right atrial appendage or in the his bundle location or where the bundle of his is it 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 records the electrical activity between those two electrodes at the tip of the catheter so it represents the electrical activity in a localized area recorded between two 
uh, two electrodes. Contrary to, uh, contrary to ECG, intracardiac electrograms only record the rapid depolarization phase of phase zero of the cardiac action potential. So the depolarization phase is recorded. Contrary to ECG, would record both the depolarization and repolarization that happens across the across the cardiac myocyte. So intracardiac electrograms, as I said, displays the local electrical activity which is recorded from the electrodes which are placed inside the cardiac chambers. And once you place a catheter inside in a particular location, as I said, in the right RV apex or right atrial appendage, it would record the local electrical activity. It would depict the local electrical activity, which would be which would be called the near field electrogram. So whatever is recorded from tissues which are very close to the electrodes uh, is, de is denoted as the near field electrograms. In fact, these electrodes can also record electrical activity from tissue which is slightly remote from, the, from, its, uh, from its position. It can also record from the neighboring, uh, my neighboring myocytes or from the neighboring tissues as well, which, would be, uh, which is coined as a far field electrogram. As expected, near field electrograms are going to be higher frequency and could be be having would be more sharper and would be having larger amplitudes, while far field would be lower amplitude and would have a lower would be lower frequency signals. The point uh, we understood is that ele the, these electrodes would not only really record electrical activity from the point where they are placed, but they also can record electrical activity from the neighborhood. So uh, the, it, it should not be directly correlated from uh, the all the signals that you see might not be recorded from clearly the point of contact of the catheter. Now, what other information these electrograms give? Based on uh, each location or wherever you place these catheters, these electrograms give you information on the local activation timings. That is, it tells, uh, tells you what time the particular area is getting activated in sinus to them or during an arrhythmia. Based on the based on the uh, uh, signals from different electrodes or different bipoles, you can also understand the direction of propagation of the electrical activity within the field view of the recording electrode. So, if you have a ten pole catheter, uh, looking at how the uh, the activation sequence, looking at the activation sequence in each bipole or each unipole, unipole, you can actually understand the direction of propagation of impulse. Also, under, by looking at the morphology of the signal, morphology of the electrogram recorded by the bipole, you can, under, you can have a fairly good idea about the, uh, the, the, uh, the health of the underlying myocardial tissue, the copper, and it also gives you a lot of information on the, the, the myocardial activation pattern in the, lo in the local tissue that is being recorded. So, so they are not, there is nothing um, uh, ECG versus intracardiac electrograms. In fact, ECG and intracardiac electrograms are complementary events on the timeline. Essentially, in EP, it's all about pattern recognition. As we know, with, uh, similarly as with an ECG, with the intracardiac electrograms also, it's all about a particular pattern. In sinus rhythm, there's a, there's a very specific pattern of activation and very specific morphology of electrograms you find in different pattern, different places of the heart. So there are very clearly recognizable patterns. Since we do these studies, we are placing the catheters in very strategically located, in very strategic positions, which are universal. So there's a particular pattern of um, a pattern that you see in a normal sinus rhythm. And once you understand this pattern, it's all about pattern recognition. Once you understand a normal pattern, whenever you see something abnormal, it will, you will, it will straight away strike you, and they say abnormal will jump right out the. So this is the classical location where we place the catheters. So we place in uh, a quadripolar, means a four-pole catheter in the, in the high right atrium. We place one uh, quadripolar catheter in the right ventricular apex. We place another quadripolar catheter in the tricuspid annulus or the membranous uh, interventricular septum recording the His bundle. And we place one decapolar catheter or 10-pole catheter in the coronary sinus. So this is uh, what would constitute a, a typical, a typical uh, uh, catheter positions for a conventional EP. So th this is uh, the typical uh, quadripolar uh, catheter or the quadripole uh, catheter that we use.
This is the typical uh, quadruple port capacitor that we use to be placed in the right hip lap bandage or this bundle or the right bundle clap. So you can see that there are uh, four poles, and uh, uh, essentially we would record bipolar signals between pole one and pole two, which we call as this cell. If you record the bi bipolar signal between the electrode two and electrode three, we call it bit signal, and if we record the electric signal between the Poles three and four, we call it proximal. Uh, we annotate it as proximal. So if if it is the his bundle catheter, if it is his bundle catheter, the distal most electrode bipolar difference between the distal most bipolar recording between the distal most electrode and second electrode is denoted as his bundle distal recording. The uh, majority of the times we record just the his bundle distal and his bundle proximal. So his bundle would record the bipole between the electrode 3 and electrode 4. And if you want, if you want more uh, information, sometimes you also record the mid, this bundle mid, which is the bipole, uh, which is the uh, bipole generated between the uh, electrode 2 and electrode 3. So as expected, so looking at this itself, you can understand um, yeah, if you have placed this electrode in the proper his bundle location, a digital bipole or the his bundle cell is going to have a larger V and a very smaller A signal. A his bundle mid is going to have a more prominent his bundle signal, a smaller V and slightly more prominent A. His bundle proximal signal is going to have a larger A and a smaller V. So we also take unipolar recordings. So unipolar recording is, re is recorded between a single electrode and a, 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 a different electrode, which is either a Wilson center terminal, or sometimes we have an electrode which is in the inferior vena cava, which forms the reference electrode. So unipolar is, is the uh, uh, unipolar uh, electrogram is actually the potential difference between the single electrode that you're recording from to a reference electrode, which is either a reference electrode in the IVC or Wilson Center Terminal. Mostly we use the Wilson Center Terminal, but then there are a lot of artifacts when you use Wilson Center Terminal. So the best thing is to have a reference electrode in the IVC. So both the uh, the, uh, the electrode from which the unipole is generated, unipolar electrogram is generated, as well as the reference electrode is in the uh, is in the vascular system. So there's not much change in the impedance. And they are in contact with blood. So uh, uh, having a reference electrode in IBC gives you the best unipolar records. And unipolar uh, recording will also give you a hell lot of information. So, by, so once you have uh, these electrodes, you can record unipolar uh, uh, unipolar electrograms from the uh, from electrode uh, one and electrode two. So this is the unipolar uh, unidistal means the unipolar recording from. Uh, uh, the digital most electrode, and this is the second one is the unipolar recording from the proximal electrode. In fact, the bipolar recording is nothing but the difference between the unipolar distal and unipolar proximal, and that is what is generated as the bipolar. So, unipolar recordings actually measure the amplified portion of the voltage of a single electrode, and so since it records from a single electrode, it retains both the near field and far field components. Bipolar electrogram, on the contrary, is the amplified difference between two unipolar electrodes, and hence the common components of noise and power field signals get separated out. So, since both uh, the electrode one and electrode two both would record the common uh, uh, noise and the power field signal components, they get subtracted out, and and uh, so more precise uh, information is obtained from the bipolar record. So this is the, uh, the typical uh, catheter positions as I alluded to earlier. So on left hand side you have the RO projection and on right hand side you have the LEO projection. So this gives you the typical uh, prototype uh, positions where we keep placing the diagnostic catheters. The first catheter is on the right hip lap bandage. You can see the RO and LEO where it is. Second catheter is on, on the location of uh, on the transmit annulus. Um, uh, where the uh, where there is the uh, membranous interventricular septum, where you have the penetrating bundle of this. Um, uh, so you can see where his little catheter is on the RA and LAO, and the third catheter, quadripolar catheter, is the RB apex, and uh, the fourth catheter is the capolar catheter in the coronary sinus. 
and uh, on the LA it will cross the spine and the RAO it will be seen in the pad of fat near the uh, pad of fat where the uh, tricuspid annulus is. So once you have placed in these catheters um, at the ECG, we uh, the the uh, this so the signals are actually uh, recorded. With all the signals, all the catheters are actually connected to the junction box, which is also connected to the stimulator, and the ablation catheter is connected to the RF generator. From there, the signals are actually filtered, so subsequently amplified, and they are connected to the main display screen. So you have two display screens: one is an offline uh, display screen, and one is a real-time screen, which gives you the live transmission. On one hand side, you have the uh, the, the, the offline display screen, where which you can uh, update the screen and do specific measurements that you want. And uh, this is uh, the typical um, uh, EP, uh, EP system, uh, uh, which uh, records all these signals. And this is what your EP uh, screen would show out to. So you should understand where to look at the EP screen uh, during a electrophysiologic study. You should understand what these screen, what information these screens are giving you. Typically, for the basic, uh, basic EP study, this would be the, the, the common way. Dif different people have different different ways in which they would set up your uh, basic screen. And they would generally, everyone would have uh, three uh, three or four uh, surface uh, uh, leads, uh, surface ECG leads. Actually, essentially, everyone would like to place um, uh, lead two and AVF, um, which looks at lead, uh, sorry, lead one and AVF. Lead one would uh, generally give you uh, right to left activation. Lead AVF would give you superior to inferior activation of the, uh, um, uh, on the surface ECG. So, so on the surface ECG, we generally keep um, four facings. One is lead one, which gives you right to left uh, AVF, which gives superior inferior activation. And then uh, lead V1 and sometimes V6 to look at uh, the uh, the precordial activation pattern, essentially look for bundle branch blocks, so on and so forth. So uh, three or four uh, surface leads should be there. Sir, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there are messages in the chat box for going little slow. They are not able to grab it. Okay, sir. Okay, so this would be the typical uh, uh, typical uh, screen. Um, uh, of the uh, typical EP study, so as I said, you would have um, uh, you would have uh, at least uh, three or four uh, surface ECG uh, leads which are pinned in. Uh, essentially, lead one, which looks at right to left activation, lead AVF, which looks at superior to inferior activation, V1 and V6 is to look for the precordial activation pattern. Essentially, to look for whether there is a bundle branch block or not. And then the uppermost uh, that would be pinned would be the right atrial which is placed by the appendix. Uh, again, uh, the, the proximal, uh, RA proximal means, which is recorded from uh, uh, electrode 3 and 4, RA distal means, which is recorded from uh, the electrode 1 and 2. Subsequently, the his bundle, uh, intra uh, his bundle ETMs would be connected, uh, would be pinned into, so his bundle ETMs would have uh, atrial depolarization followed by a very sharp uh, his bundle depression followed by the ventricular electrograms. Again, um, most of the time we would uh, pin in uh, as his bundle proximal and distal, where his bundle proximal would record uh, activity from uh, both the electro three and four of the quadrifold placed in his uh, his bundle location, and uh, his bundle distal would record uh, the bifold from uh, the electrodes one and two. So essentially, his bundle distal, as I said earlier, would have a more prominent B, and his bundle proximal would have a more prominent A. Then you have the coronary sinus uh, or the CS uh, called decapolar catheter, which, uh, uh, which is a decapolar catheter, which means there are 10 electrodes and uh, which would generate uh, five, uh, five bipolar recordings. So um, the electrode one and two would be labeled as distal. CS distal means CS one and two. That means a uh, bipolar, uh, bipolar between the uh, CS uh, electrode one and two. Subsequently, CS3 um, uh, and 4, then CS5 and 6, then CS7 and 8, and CS proximal will be a bipole between electrode 9 and 10. People, uh, uh, every electrophysiologist has a different uh, pattern of labeling, but uh, most of them would label that. Uh, universally, you would label distal and proximal correct, then subsequently, you can label it as, uh, based, uh, based on the electrodes that you're measuring, like CS12, CS34, CS56, CS78, and CS910. Or you can label it as uh, CS1 being distal, then CS2 
being the CS, uh, then CS3, CS4, and then CS5 being the more proximal, uh, simply as the bipolar. So it is, uh, but essentially distal and proximal are universally uh, uh, used to denote the recording for the distal most electrodes, that is 1 and 2, and proximal is always for the uh, proximal most electrodes, that is 9 and 10. Then low most would be the, uh, the recording from the right ventricular uh, quadripolar catheter, again, uh, uh, the proximal and this would be how the classical uh, base screen would look up. And you should also understand that while uh, we record the ECG in at 25 millimeter per second speed, the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the EGM tracing or EP tracings can be recorded. The speed uh, can be adjusted anywhere between 25 millimeter per second to 500 millimeter, uh, millimeter per second. And uh, the uh, uh, the faster speed uh, you give uh, you uh, uh, the faster speed you make the more finer details you can see. So on one so this makes it clear. Yeah, essentially what you see on the ECG is always uh, uh, you all know that it is recorded at 25 millimeter per second. Left hand side uh, the tracings you can see it's recorded at 50 50 millimeter per second. So when you record it at 50 millimeter per second, it gives you an overall picture of what is happening. Like when the arrhythmia got induced. So since it's recording at 50 millimeter per second, you can see more uh, uh, more waveforms, and so you can get an overall picture. So it would be like looking at the entire holder of the uh, of uh, what raising was done. And uh, when you look at, uh, at um, faster speeds like uh, 300 millimeter per second or 200 millimeter per second, you get finer details. So you have you have finer uh, information on which. That program is earlier uh, on uh, finer details of the morphology of each that program and uh, more information on the sequence of activation. So speeds are adjustable, and uh, in lab you would understand that it is uh, essentially most of the uh, information is actually uh, in, uh, uh, conveyed uh, uh, as conveyed or expressed in, in milliseconds rather than beats per minute. And it's essentially, if you want to see cycle length in uh, milliseconds, it is nothing but 60,000 by rate in beats per minute, and uh, vice versa. So, uh, uh, rate, if you want to, if somebody says a tachycardia at a cycle length of uh, 600, uh, uh, cycle length of 600, it means uh, so it is just uh, if you want to calculate the rate, you just have to have uh, you just have to do 60,000 divided by the cycle length. So. Uh, generally, all the information is uh, conveyed at um, a cycle length in milliseconds. So uh, this is the ECG to electrogram correlation. So you have the surface e ECG on the top, and then you have the electrograms below it. So you have the electrograms recorded by from the high rise ATM, electrograms recorded from the Hisbandel catheter, electrograms recorded from the catheter, and electrograms recorded from the RV epithelial catheter. So simply to understand uh, what constitutes atrial depolarization, what constitutes ventricular depolarization, you just have to draw arbitrary lines from the onset of P wave to the end of P wave. Any electrogram in the casing which comes from the onset of P wave to the end of P wave constitutes atrial depolarization. Any electrogram comes between onset of uh, the QRS to the end of QRS constitutes a ventricular depolarization and something that comes in between is a late depolarization or a hispandal recording. So once you have got uh, uh, the, uh, the electrograms recorded, then by looking at the electrograms, you try to understand further information and essentially you look at three important aspects. One is the morphology of the electrogram, next is the amplitude of the electrogram, and third is the duration of the electrogram. So, first looking at the morphology, it all stems up uh, again going back to the Ebervin's law, which says that when an impulse goes towards the positive electrode of the recording uh, bipole, it would be positive. And so, if an impulse is traversing in this direction and this is the positive recording electrode, it will have a prominent R wave or, prom or a prominent positive deflection. While if it is going at a slightly angulated, at a slightly uh, angulated view, but towards the positive electrode, it would still be a positive deflection, but would not have the same amplitude as an impulse directly going towards the recording positive electrode. 
If it's going uh, perpendicular, you will have a biphasic uh, uh, program. If it's going in the opposite direction, uh, you will have a negative program. And if it is going exactly away from the recording a positive electrode, it will give a prominent CUS or a prominent negative electrogram. So we'll just uh, look at uh, how an electrogram will look at three locations. One is location A, one is the other is location B, and three is location C in the right atrium in a person who has a normal sinus rhythm. So as you all know, impulse originates. So the first electrode or electrode A So the first electrode or, uh, or that as is denoted as the electrode A is located in the high right atrium on the posterior wall of the high, high right atrium at the SCT RA junction and so it is very clear, very near the sinus node. And so when the impulse starts from the sinus node and moves away for the electrode at position A, all the impulses are moving away and so it will record a steep to a pattern. So a steep QS pattern would be recorded in electrode A. Subsequently, as the impulse traverses towards electrode B and then moves away from electrode B, if you have this electrode which is in the mid, uh, mid right atrium, you can see initially the impulse uh, uh, traverses towards electrode B and so you have a positive deflection and subsequently the impulse traverses away from electrode B and then you have a negative deflection. So you have a biphasic RS pattern in electrode B if it is recording from the mid right atrium. On the contrary, for an electrode which is placed in the lower right atrium, that is at the position C, between sinus for all the time of atrial activation, all the impulse, throughout the time the impulse is traversing towards the electrode C and so it will, it will denote a positive R or a, very, uh, a positive uh, deflection would be recorded during a normal uh, sinus rhythm or a normal activation in a right atrium if the recording is from the lower right atrium or if the recording is done from the IBC RA junction. So this gives you a lot of information. So weak sinus rhythm or weak arrhythmia, if an impulse is originating from a particular site and you're recording at the precise site of origin of impulse, if you are recording a unipolar, unipolar electrogram, that means you are recording from a finite uh, a single electrode from where the impulse is originating, so it will always be QS because all the impulses are going away from the recording electrode. And so that gives you clearly the site of origin of arrhythmia. So that's how simple it is. So that is the most important information an unipolar recording gives you. So in, in uh, any focal arrhythmia, it is all about finding the site of origin of this focal arrhythmia or site of activate or the earliest site of activation in a focal arrhythmia. And uh, once you start recording, so suppose you have a, a focal atrial tachycardia which is originating from the right atrial appendage and you place an electrode, you place an electrode in the right atrial, uh, right atrial appendage. So the distal most electrode or the electrode one, if it is at the precise location of origin of the ectopic atrial impulse, for this electrode, all the impulses are going away from it. And so it will show a very steep QS pattern. It is not only important that they should show QS, the, the, uh, the uh, dB by dT or the rapidity of downstroke is also equally important. The more rapid the downstroke is, that means more that you are closest to the site of origin of the impulse. So this gives you the right information of the of the exact site of origin of uh, arrhythmic impulse, and that is where you would essentially like to burn and terminate an uh, a focal tachycardia, be it originating from the atrium or ventral. So unipolar electrogram, whenever it shows a very steep QS pattern, it gives you the precise origin or precise uh, focus of uh, origin of this arrhythmia because it will give you a very sharp QS pattern with a very steep dV by dT. On the other hand, with bipolar, since it records the difference between electrode 1 and 2, the QS between 1 and 2 is going to be subtracted, you will get a bipolar electrogram which 
if you look compared to all the other bifolds, would be earliest in the, sequ in the sequence of activation. So, at the site of origin of an arrhythmia, the bipolar recording would be the earliest. Unipolar would give you a sharp US pattern. And this is how we finally find out which is which is the focus of origin of any focal arrhythmia and then ablate that focus and uh, take care of the, uh, the most of the focal tachycardia. The next is the amplitude of the, uh, the deflection. But again, uh, the amplitude of deflection looks at uh, two aspects. One is the amount of myocardium that it is recording from. It's just like uh, if you have a very good healthy myocardium, a large amount of myocardial mass, you are going to have uh, a, a larger amplitude or a larger positive deflection, a larger R wave uh, in the electrogram. On the other hand, if you have uh, unhealthy tissue, if you have uh, diseased tissue, you would have uh, the uh, lower amplitude of the recorded electrogram. Similarly, the direction of impulse also has an implication if it is, uh, if it is going away, if it is all going in a perpendicular pattern, the amplitude will be lower. And if it, is if it is coming precisely towards the recording electrode, the amplitude would be higher. So essentially, this is looking at the health of the underlying tissue and the amplitude of the electrogram. So if you have a healthy tissue, you have this bipolar, bipolar recording showing a good health voltage. Once you have a diseased tissue, you still have electrograms, you still have recordings, but the amplitude or the amount of deflection is much less. Once you have a scar tissue, it is an electrically inert tissue, you don't have any electrograms which is recorded from the dead tissue. So uh, a Q wave on the surface EKG is a summation of all the uh, electrical window inside the heart, but with electrograms, when you record electrical potential from the scar tissue, you will have absolutely no recording uh, absolutely electrically in inexcitable tissue which denotes a scar. So the third thing that you look at is the width of the electrogram that is recorded or width of the R wave. The width of the R wave actually is dependent on the conduction speed between the electrodes or in fact it looks at the conduction speed of the uh, conduction speed of the impulse between the tissue that is recorded uh, that, that the electrodes are recording from. So if you have a healthy tissue, it is going to conduct very rapidly, and so you will have a, a shorter duration of the electrogram. So as you all know, healthy tissues are going to conduct faster, and so you will have a narrow R wave or an electrogram which is very sharp and sweet. On the other hand, if you have a diseased tissue, the, uh, the, uh, the impulse is going to take longer time to connect through a disease tissue and so slowly, so disease tissues are really going to be slowly connecting and that is why you tend to have a wider or a fractionated, a fractionated electrogram from a disease conduction tissue. So duration of the, uh, the electrogram would give you a rough correlate to the conduction speed of the underlying myocardial tissue from which it is recorded. So this would be the most important slide of uh, of my of my talk. You should understand what you, you as I said, it's all about patterns and, um, and normal electrograms are signature patterns. Essentially, you should understand what is uh, defined as abnormal electrograms. So as I said, uh, unhealthy tissues or disease tissues are going to have low amplitude. So what are the absolute cutoff numbers? In the atrium, a low amplitude electrogram is defined as an amplitude which is less than 0.5 millivolt, and in ventricle, a low amplitude electrogram is defined as an amplitude which is less than 1.5 millivolt. So less than 0.5 in the atrium and less than 1.5 in the ventricle. And so what does the low amplitude electrogram denote? It denotes you have a disease tissue. The disease tissue might be because of a prior myocardial infarction or because of an infiltrative myocardial disease or an earlier fibrosis that has happened. You should also remember that if, you, if the electrode is not properly in contact with the underlying myocardial tissue, it can still have low amplitude. So low amplitude can also happen if there is poor contact between the electrode and the recording myocardial tissue. Also, if it is recording not from the near field, it's not recording any, any signal from the myocardium on which it is. In fact, if it is recording signals from something which is the neighboring neighboring area, it would record what I say as I said earlier, a field um, 
uh, phosphate electrogram, it also would be of lower amplitude. So when you have a lower amplitude electrogram being recorded, first ensure that you have good contact between the catheter and the underlying myocardial tissue. Once you have good contact, if the voltage is less than 0.5, the atrium is less than 1.5, the ventricle are dealing with a diseased tissue. The next is fractionated electrograms. So as I said, fractionated means you have a prolonged low amplitude electrogram with multiple peaks. So a fractionated electrogram by definition should be in duration more than 70 milliseconds. So uh, as I said, it takes longer duration to conduct through a diseased tissue and if the, if the uh, time of uh, conduction through this diseased tissue is more than 70 milliseconds, we quantify them as a fractionated electrograms. And fractionated electrograms are, are found in the pretty infarct tissues. It is not found in a scar. It is found when you have healthy surviving myocardial fibers within the scar or in the pretty infarct areas. When you have areas which are very slowly conducting, it can also happen because of catheter motions and arborized myocardial fractions. Now, what defines a double potential or a split electrogram? So split electrogram means from the same bipole, you have two components which are separated by an isoelectric interval of 70 milliseconds. Essentially, a double potential or a split electrogram would happen when there is an area of conduction block. In the, in, the, in the site of a recording of the bipole, if there is a local conduction block, which can happen either because of an earlier surgical scar or a functional conduction block like Ustra terminalis, uh, you have a uh, recording from either side of this scar, and that would give you two components with an isoelectric interval between them, which should be more than 70 seconds. Then what com constitutes, the next is what constitutes late potentials or late components or uh, late potentials in an electrogram. So, as I said earlier, every electrogram is correlated with the surface ECG. And so if you have a atrial depolarization that happens after the period, or an electrogram which is recorded from the ventricle which happens after the QRS ends, then we call it as a late potential. So late potential essentially indicates a delayed activation or an area of slow conduction, essentially indicating that it is a diseased tissue. So in a diseased tissue, the conduction happens very slowly, and that is why it would be recorded after the end of P wave or after the end of QR. And it essentially signifies the underlying unhealthy tissue. Now, continuous electrograms mean there is no isoelectric interval throughout the diastole at all, and it happens like you have an extensively diseased tissue which is slowly conducting throughout the, uh, throughout the cardiac cycle. That would constitute what, it, what we call as a continuous signal, no isoelectric interval at all. Diastolic signal is event diastolic electrogram is anything where in which you have potential in mid diastole bounded by two isoelectric intervals, and it essentially is uh, found in uh, found in uh, where you, and it denotes something what we call as the isthmus of the critical uh, zone of uh, reentrant arrhythmia. Frequency signal means you have a low dB by dT, and it is essentially uh, denotes either it's an artifact. Uh, or it's a far field signal. As I said, far field, uh, it means that the, uh, the it is recording from the neighboring tissues and it will have a lower dV by dT. Unipolar electrograms also um, give you important information. And whenever you see uh, injured current pattern, that is an ST elevation on the unipolar electrogram, that means you are, ha you are having excessive contact pressure of the electrode on the tissue or there is a local tissue injury. So if you are uh, keeping an electrode and you are poking the electrode on the myocardial tissue, if you are causing uh, a local contact, increased local contact pressure or local tissue injury, you will have ST elevation on the unipolar electrogram from the pit electrode. Now, as I said, um, we need to correlate the surface ECG. Uh, you all know that the P wave denotes atrial depolarization. The PR interval denotes the time of activation from the AV node. To the, uh, uh, to the distal hypopathy system and QRS denotes a, si a simultaneous uh, activation of both the ventricles and uh, programs uh, are recorded from each of these um, catheters that we place in would, would be correlated with the surface ECG.
to understand the activation sequence in each of the chambers. So, first of all, the right atrial catheter. As I said, the right atrial catheter is uh, preferentially placed at the SVC RA junction in the posterolateral wall or the right atrial appendage. And it denotes the, it records the high right atrial activation. And uh, so, it would be recording an electrical signal in the earlier part of. So, it would be recording a signal in the earlier part of the CV. The coronary sinus catheter is actually placed in the coronary sinus, which is actually located. It's a decapolar catheter, as I said, that has uh, 10 electrodes, and uh, you would five, book, uh, five bipolar recordings, uh, which is denoted as the distal to CS proximal. And uh, since it is on the mitral annulus, it would record signals from both the left atrium and the postrobasal part of the left ventricle. So here, the first signal would be the atrial signal, so anything which is lined up along the blue line would be the atrial signal. So since it uh, gives information on the left atrial activation, it would be recorded on the later part of the T wave, and the ventricular signal would indicate activation of the postrobasal part of the left ventricle. Now, we'll just look at the normal activation pattern. So. So we start off. So the impulse in a normal sinus rhythm, impulse starts in the uh, sinus node, and so the earliest activation would be recorded from the high right atrial catheter. In fact, the recording, if the if the high right atrial catheter is precisely placed at the location of the sinus node, electrogram in the high right atrial catheter would be recorded about 20 milliseconds before the beginning of the TV because. TV would be recorded only after the impulses get traversed from the from the right atrium through the tissues uh, to the body surface and reach the electrode on the body surface. So if the, the electrogram on the high right atrium precisely at the post of sinus uh, node would be at least 15 20 milliseconds before the onset of TV. So the first recording would be on the high right atrial electrogram. Subsequently, the right atrial activation happens first. And the last part of the right atrium to be activated would be the lower right atrium uh, at the, the, near the tricuspid annulus, for which we have a recording from the uh, proximal hisbundle catheter. So the proximal, uh, proximal bipole of the hisbundle catheter is located on the tricuspid annulus. Uh, yeah. So that will be the last part of the right atrium to be activated. So the right atrial activation is from the high right atrial catheter to the uh, to the atrial electrogram in the proximal his bundle electrogram. So his proximal right atrial uh, high right atrial catheter denotes right atrial activation, and that would constitute the proximal uh, the, the first part of the TV. After the right atrial activation, you have the left atrial activation, and the left atrial activation is actually denoted by the activation pattern in the coronary sinus catheter. And um, uh, so the coronary sinus catheter activation pattern correlates with the second half of the T wave as that denotes the left atrial activation. And so in normal sinus rhythm, so this would be the normal pattern of activation in the atrium. So the earliest one, the, uh, the earliest uh, uh, signal would be in the uh, would be in the high right atrial catheter, followed by the his uh, followed by the his bundle proximal electrode, the his bundle distal electrode, then the CS proximal electrode. The last depolarization would be seen in the CS distal electrode. So this would be a normal activation pattern or the atrial activation. And then uh, we record the his bundle catheter. As I said, uh, the his bundle catheter is located at the at the annulus um, and it records a, a, a atrial signal, a sharp his bundle potential and ventricular signal. And this is how we place in the uh, his bundle catheter. So the catheter is placed into the right ventricle. You get a large ventricular potential. Subsequently, it is withdrawn, and you get a narrow spike preceding the ventricular potential, which is essentially the right bundle uh, potential. And the during the time interval between the right bundle potential and the local electrogram in the catheter would be less than 30 milliseconds. And then from there, you gradually pull back the catheter further with a uh, with clock stop so as to align the catheter with the septum. And you would reach more, slightly more proximal area where you have atrial and ventricular potential, which are approximately equal in size. 
and you have a biphasic or a triphasic deflection which appears between them which represents the his bundle electrogram so you go into the right ventricle get a ventricular potential pull back get a right bundle potential proceeding the ventricular potential pull back further get a get a, get to the tricuspid annulus where you have a and b which is equal in size and a sharp biphasic or triphasic deflection between a and b which is this is the sharp uh, biphasic deflection between a and b which denotes the his bundle uh, his bundle recording and um, this is the right bundle recording the duration between, between right bundle recording and uh, surface uh, uh, qrs or the local uh, local uh, electrogram would be less than 30 milliseconds and that's how we differentiate his bundle recording from the right bundle recording so his bundle recording would not have a preceding visual electrogram and the duration from right bundle recording to the, uh, to, the uh, uh, to the onset of qrs would be uh, less than 30 milliseconds so once you have got a, uh, got a very sharp uh, biphasic or triphasic signal, which we call the his bundle recording, you need to validate that because a lot of information on the AV conduction, a lot of information of the activate of the of various tachycardias are validated are actually uh, guided by where the his bundle recording. Is. So uh, in ideal principles, you should always uh, validate a his bundle potential and. Uh, um, the first thing to be uh, to be understood is that you should not mistake a right bundle potential uh, to, uh, to a his bundle potential. As I said, when you're having only a right bundle potential, you would not have a preceding atrial uh, uh, you would not have a preceding atrial electrogram, and the duration between the right bundle potential and uh, the QRS or the onset of ventricular activation would be less than 30 milliseconds. As you all know, when a person has a, a, a manifest free excitation, then the uh, HV interval would be shorter. But in a normal sinus rhythm, in the absence of free excitation, a normal HV interval should be between 35 to 55 milliseconds. Now, of all the recordings, when you do this, you should always take the Hisbunt recording from the proximal most Hisbunt reflection, which has A and, e, e, uh, a and V electrograms, which are equal in size. Uh, with almost the largest atrial electrogram which you can record in that. To further validate the Hisbundle potential, you can face the face at this location and ideally facing at a uh, facing at the location or the precise location of the Hisbundle electrogram, you should have a QRS which is which is absolutely similar to the sine of the QRS and the interval between the stim. To, uh, interval between the stim to the QRS should be equal to the HV interval. So when you're facing the his bundle catheter, you should have a morphology which is similar to sinus rhythm ECG, and uh, the stimulus to V interval should be identical to the HV interval in sinus rhythm, and that validates that the his bundle recording we have got. The his bundle recording you should also know that can be recorded from the left uh, from the uh, uh, from the left side of the heart, once you go into the aorta, even the, the precise location is actually at the right coronary uh, from the RCC NCC junction, or some uh, or the precise exact location where the penetrating bundle of his comes is at the RCC NCC junction. So at the RCC NCC junction, also you can record the his bundle deflection. You can also validate by pushing uh, a catheter from aorta to the left ventricle, record the left bundle. Uh, left bundle potential on the left side and uh, further validate your his bundle recording. Coming to the ventricular activation, so ventricular activation, as I said, uh, you have, uh, uh, you record it from the RB In fact, uh, in a normal sinus rhythm, the impulse comes uh, from the, uh, uh, from the atrium, reaches the AV load, goes through the, uh, goes through the bundle of his, reach, uh, goes through the uh, right bundle, left bundle, reaches the his perfect system, goes to the the fibers that reaches the myocardium. In fact, the earliest part of the ventricle from which you would record uh, the ventricular, de uh, ventricular depolarization is the RV apex. That is where the first arborization of the um, arborization of his birth system happens. And so the earliest ventricular activation uh, would be from the RV apex. Subsequently, from the RV apex, the impulse would go to either side. So subsequently, you would start recording uh, electrograms from the uh, 
Uh, from the CS catheter, we should record the electrical activity from the postrobasal part of the left ventricle. And also, you can record the ventricular activity, ventricular decompensation from the distal inspital catheter. So, the quadricular catheter, uh, so this is the sequence of activation in the atrium and ventricle. In normal sinus rhythm, as I said, you will have the surface electrode. In the normal sinus rhythm, uh, this would be the basic tracing. You have the surface leads on the top. The earliest uh, program would be the high atrium, followed by the his bundle proximal, followed by the his bundle distal, then the activation of the CS from proximal to distal. So, this is the normal atrial activation sequence. It starts with the high right atrium, goes towards the pro his bundle proximal to distal, and then from CS proximal to CS distal. On the other hand, in the ventricular sequence, the sequence of activation, the earliest part to be activated would be the right ventricular. Subsequently, the, the CS, uh, as, uh, the CS uh, electrogams would be seen, the ventricular electrogams, the CS ketic uh, would be seen, and then the electrograms in the his bundle recording would be seen. So, this is the normal factor of activation. The, uh, see, the, the importance is if you look at these three beats. You can see on the first beat is a typical uh, sinus rhythm beat. You can see the normal uh, pattern of activation of the atrium and normal pattern of activation of the ventricle. The si second beat, you can see the, if you look at the atrial activation pattern, the earliest activation is actually seen in CS distance. So this is really not, the impulse is not originating from the sinus node. The impulse is originating from the atrial tissue which is near the CS distal or it is actually somewhere in the yeah, in the left atrium. So this is an ectopic atrial impulse which is originating from the atrial, uh, from the atrial uh, tissue which is near the CS distal electrode. And from there it is activating both the ventricles uh, uh, sequentially. So you, once you understand the normal activation pattern of atrium, by just looking at the atrial activation pattern in the electrodes, in the, in the, uh, uh, from the catheters that you have, you can precisely say whether it is normal sinus rhythm or an ectopic atrial rhythm. Similarly, if you look at this third uh, third beat, you have a few uh, white squares morphology, essentially indicating that um, it, it is an abnormal impulse. You can see that the earliest activation is happening in the right ventricular apex. It is uh, uh, it's an LBV morphology with negative depression in V1. So it's an it's an ectopic uh, or it's a ventricular uh, ventricle complex which is originated from the RV apex. Because the earliest activation of the ventricle is happening at RV apex, and subsequently the ventricle activation is seen in the his bundle recording. And then you have retrograde atrial activation, with retrograde atrial activation being the earliest in the proximal. So these are the atrial signals. So you have the atrial activation from uh, go, going retrograde from the ventricle. That's what you call retrograde ventricular atrial activation. And so here, the earliest retrograde atrial activation is in the CS proximal. And then uh, you have the activation of the, uh, the his bundle atrial uh, electrogram and subsequently the high atrial atrial electrogram. So the, the third impulse is a, a premature ventricular complex with a retrograde atrial activation. So once you understand the signature pattern of a normal sinus rhythm activation of the uh, electrograms in the classical catheters that we place and the normal ventricular activation patterns, you can understand whenever there is an ectopic impulse or uh, 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 impulse originating from the abnormal side. In the basic intervals. So, PA interval indicates the interatrial conduction time. So, PA interval it means the time of activation from the onset of P wave. To the, uh, to the atrial electrogram that is recorded in this bundle catheter, and that indicates the activation time in the right atrium, and the normal range is somewhere between 20 to 60 milliseconds. The AH interval actually indicates the interval between uh, interval which is recorded between the atrial electrogram in the his bundle catheter to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the his bundle recording, and so AH interval actually indicates the AV interval conduction time. And uh, the normal value is somewhere between 60 to 140. His bundle recording means the duration of the his bundle sharp his bundle potential, and it should be between 25 milliseconds. And XV interval recording means the recording from the onset of his bundle recording to the earliest ventricular depolarization, which is mostly on the surface QRS. 
And so a normal HV interval be, will be between 35 to 45 milliseconds. And we're alluding to it in data. So, so PA interval means from the onset of the wave to the atrial electrogram in his bundle computer. And so it indicates the activation period of the entire ATM. AH interval is recorded from the atrial electrogram in his bundle uh, uh, his editor, sharp his deflection, indicates the AV local condition. And here HV interval means the same interval from the sharp his deflection to the earliest when the depolarization most of the time is seen on surface QRS, and so it indicates the conduction time through the his pinky system before it reaches the ventricular myocard. So PA interval, uh, the normal value, as I said, is 55 to 55 milliseconds, and uh, is the time interval between the earliest atrial activation, the region of sinus node, and the atrial activation, the AV node. The AH interval is uh, 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 correlates to the AV nodal conduction time. The normal it is very much dependent on the sympathetic and parasympathetic tone, and so it has a wider range. In normal sinus system, the AH interval can range between 40 to 140 milliseconds, and in children, the age interval is going to be lower. Even during a sing, since it is very much affected by the autonomic tone, very much affected by drugs, even in a single CP study, the age interval can vary up to 20 milliseconds based on the patient's autonomic tone. Again, the measurement is taken from the earliest we produce rapid deflection of the atrial electrogram in the his bundle recording to the onset of his bundle deflection defined as the earliest deflection from the baseline. Again, HV interval is the most important uh, measurement of all these things. Uh, HV interval uh, actually represents the conduction time from proximal his bundle to the ventricular myocardium. And the measurement is actually taken from the beginning of his bundle deflection to the earliest onset of ventricular activation, which in most of the time is recorded from the surface of the program. So it is from the onset of his bundle program to the uh, to the onset of QRS, whichever has whichever lead shows the earliest onset of QRS. Normal value is 35 to 55 milliseconds, and to understand that these HV intervals are not affected by autonomic tone, although it may be affected by the antiarrhythmic drugs the patient is taking. So what are the advantages of having intracardiac electrograms? So you all know that uh, on the first PCG, you never understand how the, his bundle is activated. His bundle recordings are all only obtained from intracardiac electrograms. You can also, uh, with intracardiac electrograms, uh, you can understand the activation pattern in different parts of the uh, different parts of the chambers or, uh, or different parts of the chambers. You can also uh, measure the precise uh, intervals, the precise uh, time period between the activation from one electrode to the other electrode from one catheter to the other catheter. Um, you can also do the various uh, pacing protocols and various dynamic maneuvers to understand the mechanism of. On the other hand, ECG, the information that the electrograms do not provide and what the ECG gives are the T wave changes, the summated the QRS morphology, because on seeing the electrograms, you can never say whether there's a right bundle branch block morphology or there's a left bundle branch um, morphology pattern of aberrant conduction. Uh, you cannot understand the repolarization patterns. You do not have any idea of, of the um, Repolarization pattern, that is, you don't understand what are, whether there is a repolarization injury, like whether there is a changes. Um, yeah, that is what the electrograms do not give. Now, um, I'll quickly wind up with uh, what uh, uh, what uh, these uh, correlations help in different forms of arrhythmias. Like, so suppose you are dealing with an atrial arrhythmia. On the ECG, you will have an idea of the the rate, the, uh, the rate of the uh, the rate of the arrhythmia, you will have an idea of the P wave morphology, whether it's a, it's a, it's um, a discrete P wave or it's actually a flutter wave. Whether there is an isoelectric line between the P wave or there is no isoelectric line, as it uh, it would be seen in a typical flutter. On the other hand, with, with, with uh, the EP study, you can understand uh, this, uh, uh, any atrial arrhythmia, whether it is having a focal origin or it's a re-entrant arrhythmia. Uh, it's again based on the activation pattern, and uh, uh, in a macro re arrhythmia, you will not see one part earlier. There would be a, uh, there would be a continuous activation uh, throughout the uh, throughout the cardiac cycle, where focal atrial uh, tachycardia would have a focal origin source. 
uh, you can understand, you can, you can locate where the source of uh, the arrhythmia is in a focal uh, it's tachycardia and in a re-entrant circuit, you can understand the components of the circuit and identify the targets of ablation. Radiarrhythmia on the surface ECG, you can understand there is a bundle branch block, uh, whether, there, uh, whether there is actually a, uh, whether, the, uh, whether there is an AV block or not. Based on the conductive PR interval, you can have a rough idea. For example, if a person is having a 2 is to 1 AV block, you look at the conducted PR interval. If the conducted PR interval of uh, a person having 2 is to 1 AV block is more than 300 milliseconds, then it mostly indicates that the disease is going to be in the AV node. While if the conducted PR interval in a person having 2 is to 1 AV block is less than 160 milliseconds, then essentially the disease is going to be in the Hispofingy system um, or the bundle branches. So in a person, uh, in any form of AV block, you are mostly interested in knowing whether it's a nodal block or an infranodal block. The best clue on the ECG is to look at the conducted PR interval. As I said earlier, when you look at the PR interval, uh, there are many things constitute the PR interval. It includes the PA time, the AH time, and the HP interval. So you know that the AH interval is somewhere between 65 to 140 milliseconds, while HP interval just correlates 35 to 55 milliseconds. So if you have a disease in the Hisper Fingy system, the HV interval can increase from 55 to say 70 or 80. Even then, there would be just 30 milliseconds increase in the PR interval. Not much increase in the PR interval, but the person will be having AV block with blocks in the heat pricing system. On the other hand, if there is a delayed AV nodal conduction, the AH interval can stretch for much longer durations, like the AH interval can be it's normally 65 to 140, the AH interval can become 200, 250, and then the interval can be more than 700 milliseconds, and that indicates that the, the disease is a nodal disease. On EP study, on the other hand, you can precisely state where the, the, where the level of AV block is. Also, you can study the effective refractory period at each level. For example, this case has a prolonged uh, PR interval, and this person has syncope. So, on the surface EKG, you can just say that there is a prolonged PR interval, the block or the level of block can be either in the atrium, like in this in this time in this case you have uh, a prolonged PA conduction time, and in fact uh, the longer PA conduction time is slightly contributing to the uh, prolonged PR, or you can have a, a delayed conduction in the AV node. So you have a very prolonged AH interval, which is, con which is contributing to the prolonged PR in a uh, prolonged PR interval, or rarely. Such a prolonged PR interval can also happen because of a uh, disease dispersed in the system, and here the HV interval is prolonged. HV is definitely much longer, and that is contributing to a prolonged PR. But you should remember that whenever the HV interval is prolonged and there's an impulse in disease alone, unless there is a coexistent AV nodal disease, the PR, uh, PR interval will never be such, uh, such long as like 300 milliseconds. So this is uh, for the various supramental tachycardia. So if a person comes with an SPT or, or seeing the ECG, you would say that whether it's a narrow complex tachycardia uh, having, uh, happening at such a rate, whether it is regular or irregular, but whether it's a short RP or long RP tachycardia, and whether it is terminating with a P wave or a QRS. In the EP lab, once you have the catheter spaced in, we would uh, we would uh, we would uh, classify this tachycardia as uh, a narrow complex tachycardia happening at such a such cycle length with with or without uh, cycle length variations with what is the VA relationship uh, how, how, whether uh, look at the AH uh, AH as well as the HA interval whether HA is less than AH and whether it terminates with the A or terminates with the V and then denote what the arrhythmia is. It's just the nomenclature, but this is how uh, the nomenclatures differ for an arrhythmia on the ECG and electrograms. When the arrhythmia again, the ECG gives you the exit of the tachycardia and gives you uh, a possible site of origin of the tachycardia from possible which chamber or which uh, site it is originating from. So suppose you have a tachycardia which has uh, a right bundle, left axis deviation, uh, uh, so you can understand the, the ECG morphology gives you the exit of the tachycardia. On the other hand, once you have placed catheters inside, you can precisely locate 
the uh, the uh, program in each part of the ventricle, and you can understand which is the earliest activated part. You can also uh, you can also study the uh, whether there is a scar inside the ventricle by looking for the fractionated potential, looking for late potential, and you can also understand the mechanism of tachycardia, whether it's a focal tachycardia or renal tachycardia. So to conclude. Uh, essentially, surface ECG and electrograms are nothing but recordings of the electric activity of uh, heart from different, different approaches, and they provide information which are complementary to each other. Correlation of both is extremely important in delineation of arrhythmia mechanism in a patient. So, as I said, this is just a basic talk on uh, what uh, electrograms denote to, and uh, they, there is uh, uh, for every arrhythmia, for every um, and for every case, there can be uh, you can have an in-depth analysis of the correlation between the program and ECG, and uh, that in fact is the key uh, key diagnostic part in electrophysiology before uh, we find the location of the arrhythmia and ability. So, thank you for the uh, hearing, and uh, I hope uh, be, uh, after this talk you understand the key basic thing. You understand what electrograms are. You understand the normal activation sequence in um, um, uh, in the ventricle and atrium and uh, the various correlations in arrhythmia. So, so that's from my side. Uh, Sudhakar, you can take over and then let me know if there are any questions. I'm not very, really, I can't see the screen. Uh, sir, before taking the question, we'll just take three poll questions, sir. Just for the. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, sure. Any sure. answer you have the question, you can uh, open. I'll just start the poll. Any of the questions? You like uh, if you have otherwise I'll start the poll, sir. Um yeah, yeah. No. if you start the poll so I am not to see that I am having the this thing. I will just Yeah, yeah. Deepak you start the question, then I'll take the poll. Yeah. Uh, have I stopped sharing? Yeah, I've stopped sharing. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it's visible. Yes. Which one to flash? Yeah, this one is fine. So this question is the first one. His bundle recording can also be recorded from option A is RCC LCC junction, option B is RCC NCC junction. Option C is LCC and non coronary cuff junction, and option D is none of the above. So I start the poll. Yes, the poll is open. Twenty seconds left over. So the majority of answer are the right coronary cuts and non-coronary cuts. Yeah. yeah, that's correct actually. So his bundle recording can also be recorded from the RCC NCC junction. And uh, the, the other importance of this is when you have arrhythmias which is originating from the para tissue, like if you have uh, a para atrial tachycardia or you have um, an androceptal accessory pathway. Uh, so these, um, uh, so this is the most uh, difficult area to ablate. So if you have a parahistian atrial tachycardia or uh, androceptal um, accessory pathway, you don't want to ablate from the right atrium and cause uh, AV block. 
one of the safest vantage point in these uh, times is to update from the non-coronary uh, non-coronary trust actually. So when you're updating from the NCC, you can sometimes uh, uh, you, that gives you a better vantage point and the chance of AV block is less. Right? So that's the clinical importance of this. Okay. I think our next question will move. Okay, and one. See this? Uh, yeah. What lower cutoff voltage defines the low voltage in ventricle? So the options are A3 millivolt, B2 millivolt, C1.5, and D0.5 millivolt. I'll open the polling. It's on. We will just have thirty seconds for this, and I'll stop the poll. Deeper. Yes. Yes. We have got around 60% response. Let's stop the poll. Oh, uh, 1.5 might be good. Yeah, yeah, that was perfect, actually. If you should understand that our RNA is equivalent to the operating system, it might have said that point by point. Between two nearby electrodes, 
Slide and uh, the, his uh, the point is well taken. He said the B2 is an exophagical influx which is originating above, uh, above the his bundle, and so the ventricular activation pattern of this impulse should be just similar to the sinus impulse. And uh, he feels the RV activity, the morphology is slightly different. Uh, I would say that see the, uh, the morphology of this, uh, the morphology of the electrogram would. Uh, 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 would depend a lot on whether the their position has changed during the impulse or not. Because if you look at the his bundle, uh, uh, the RV impulse, uh, the, the ventricular EGM in his bundle is just almost the same. It's slight change in morphology, but it would be a possibility that with the ectopic impulse, there would have been a slight uh, a, a millimeter change in the RV, like, RV catheter. Because otherwise, when the surface QRS is absolutely the same, you would not expect a change in the morphology of the uh, local RV EGM unless the catheter has slightly changed its position. So, okay. Yeah. So, uh, Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, I think we have uh, answered majority of all the questions. Right? I mean, uh, so and also we have gone uh, beyond our timeline to answer the questions. Thanks, sir. Thanks for patiently answering each one of them. Uh, the presentation also was very elaborate and uh, very well. I mean, uh, getting good feedback about all the sessions also. We we'll request to share the presentation also. Um, so. Overall, thanks, sir. I would, from apart, uh, on behalf of Metronic, I would like to thank you for being there, for answering all the questions, and also to the participants for attending this session. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sudhakar, for being there, for coordinating the session with you. Thanks, thanks, Fernando. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sudhakar, and thank you, everyone there, and uh, take care. Take thank you, sir. Bye.